Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about Dissociative Identity Disorder. So I'll preface this by saying, recently I've been debating if I'm going to continue doing podcasts or uploading YouTube videos. And I started to think, what would I regret not doing? And looking back and checking out my movies and TV, that's fun stuff to do. But it's not something I would regret leaving. Looking back on my channel, focusing on mental health, wellness, the Foundations for Wellness is my playlist. I wanted to hit the major mental disorders slash illnesses. Get, you know, five to nine and just do podcasts on them, read the articles. And that's where we are now. I'm still not sure if I'm going to continue. But a lot of these illnesses, disorders, they impact your life in certain ways. And if it's not a loved one, friend, family, and even relationships where you boyfriend and girlfriend, which might be a little easier to handle because you could just, over the course of natural time and, you know, together you'll notice these things and issues start coming up and you break up. But when it's family, friends, and someone you love and you care for deeply, these things can hurt. They can, last, they can make a lasting impact. So I want to get these things out of the way. Get five to nine mental disorder illnesses. Have them on my podcast. This way, if I do step away, I don't feel like I regret anything. My playlist, all my stuff on my site will be there. Over 300 videos, three years of doing podcasts. But I've come to a point in my life where I need to reassess things. And going through things with certain people, certain loved ones, it's... It's trying and it leaves you, you know, sometimes hollow and empty. You just only have so much to give, only so much you could understand. And it works both ways in, in everything, in all relationships. So, disassociative identity disorder, I, the irony is not lost on me that the image I'm using is someone with red hair, someone with blue hair, and, and a darker version, you know, and the images of split personality type thing. It is pretty ironic, and that is a little bit of an in-story, private thing. But, we are going to read an article. I'll put the link in the description, as I normally do. If I forget, just remind me. I'll read it, the article probably word for word, interject my little two cents, and I might even do a little blurb on the outside, kind of coming in. Uh, you know, something attached to it, tangentially, you know, that is an interest. And some of these have links. You'll see highlighted words and sentences that lead to other things. And these are good deep dives sometimes to understand other overlapping things. I've done depression, um, you know, uh, schizophrenia. A lot of these things have overlapping um, effects and, and illnesses that come with these mental disorders, whether they're chemical um, you know, environmental, is all these factors add up. So, I'll start here. This is from the uh, National Center for, uh, National Library of Medicine. And, like I said, I'll read the article. I'll try um, to, you know, distance myself from the things that are going on in my life. With, um, you know, I have pers first-hand knowledge of this stuff. And if it's not with my mother or friends and family... It's true at the time I used to help on certain hotlines and stuff. But we'll get to this. Disassociative Identity Disorder. Um, I, does this have any uh, credit? Let me see if I can find something. Paroma, Mitra, and Kid, Jan. I don't know what that means, but maybe it's credit to somebody. When I do this, I'd like to give credit. Normally, if I do a science article, you know, it says who wrote it, that type thing. So I'll continue. Disassociative Identity Disorder, DID, is a rare psychiatric disorder diagnosed in about 1.5% of the global population. This disorder is often misdiagnosed and often requires multiple assessments for an accurate diagnosis. Patients often present with self-injurious injurious behavior and suicide attempts. This activity reviews the evaluation and treatment of disassociative identity disorder and explains the role 
of an interprofessional team in caring for patients diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder. This activity also review, reviews the association between DID and suicidal behavior. Uh, this goes on to describe uh, objectives, uh, describes the constellation of behavioral symptoms that lead to a diagnosis of disassociative identity disorder, review risk, risk factors for the development of a diagnosis of DID, explain the different modalities of evidence-based treatment for DID, and, some, and outline some interprofessional strategies. So disassociative identity disorder is a rare disorder associated with severe behavioral health symptoms. DID was previously known as multiple personality disorder until 1994, which is interesting. So all Hollywood, all, you know, it's all multiple personality disorder. Now it's, you know, disassociative identity disorder. Approximately 1.5 of the population internationally has been diagnosed with a disassociative identity disorder. Often patients with the diagnosis have, a, have several emergency presentations, often with self-injurious behavior and even substance abuse or substance use. Of note, DID has been observed and described in several countries and has not been associated with terms such as outer world possession and possession by demons. Several case reports have been des described with those terms. However, a trauma and its association came with DID much later. Etology. This associative identity disorder is typically associated with severe childhood trauma and abuse. Dalberg and his team have detailed the role of trauma in the development of this associative disorder and dismissed the previous motto, which was based on fantasy and often associated with suggestibility, cognitive distortions, and fantasy. However, newer research tends to describe a combination of both severe trauma, which may be in the form of physical, emotional, sexual, as well as some effects of cognitive suggestion. Stress experienced by an individual secondary to trauma has been seen to, contributory, to be contributory towards the formation of an accurate understanding of the trauma being unreal. Even post-traumatic disassociation, such as leaving one's body, etc., and poor sleep. However, in the fantasy theory, it has been seen that people with high levels of vulnerability, predisposition of psychological symptoms, media influences, and likely social isolation and vulnerability. Several prominent psychologists, such as Clough, have broken down the theory behind DID in some. The theory describes predisposing factors for disassociation, which include an ability to disassociate, overwhelming tra traumatic experiences that distort reality, creation of alters with specific names and identities, and lack of external stability, which leads to the child self-soothing to tolerate these stressors. These four factors must be present for DID to develop. Now, in my playlist, I have done a uh, podcast on DID before, or very close to it, uh, in talking with uh, a friend, um, I did an article called uh, The Chemical, something about the chemicals in the brain that lead to DID. So I have touched on this because in talking with my friend who I love and had a, you know, a great relationship with uh, over the years, I sometimes use that as a catalyst to go search for something and do a podcast on it and it's not just one friend it's many friends and even like i said things like this and schizophrenia are close to the issues i had with my mom growing up so this is um interesting and will continue disassociative disorders show a prevalence of one percent to five percent in the international population Severe disassociative identity disorder is present in 1 to 5%, 1 to 1.5% of the population. Patients may spend up to 5 to 12.5 years in treatment before de being de diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder. Patients with DID come with increased rates of non suicidal, self injurious behavior, and suicide attempts. The DID person per the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Disassociation, 
is described as a person who experiences separate identities that function independently of each other and are auto- autonomous of each other. The International Society describes alternate identities or alters as independent identities, which have their own distinct behaviors, have memories that are distinct from others, and even may differ in language and expressions used. Signs of a switch or altered state include trance-like behavior, eye blinking, eye rolling, and changes in posture. Now, as a side note, when I did my research when I was younger, 16, you know, trying to help my mom, I did read books on, uh, you know, mannerisms and human behavior. And you'd be surprised what people can learn from watching someone's posture and the way they move. And it also tied into, like, how magicians fool you and mentalists and stuff. Really fascinating, well, for me. Um, The major hypothesis by Putnam et al. is that alternate identities result from the inability of many traumatized children to develop a unified sense of self that is maintained across various behavioral states, particularly if the traumatic exposure first occurs before the age of five. The theories have been studied by groups in the inpatient unit services in the 1990s. The way to diagnose disassociative identity disorder is via detailed history taken by both psychiatric practitioners and experienced psychologists. Often persons with DID are misdiagnosed with other personality disorders, most commonly borderline personality disorder, as elements of disassociation are prominently seen and even amnesia. Often longitudinal assessments over long periods and careful history taking are required to complete diagnostic diagnostic evaluations. History is also gathered from multiple sources as well. Often, neurological examinations are required as well to rule out autoimmune encephalitis, often requiring electro... <laughs> you gotta leave it to me to fuck these things up. Electroxonograms, <laughs> humbar punctures, and brain imaging. Disassociative disorders are classically characterized as a disruption of normal consciousness, memory, identity, and behavior. The disorders are classically broken down into positive and negative symptoms. Positive symptoms are often associated with new personalities, derealization, and negative symptoms are symptoms such as autism and paralysis. Disassociative identity disorder is part of a larger disassociative disorder spectrum, however, has more specific criteria that are outlined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Edition. The DSM-5 criteria for DID include at least two or more distinct personalities. Each personality varies in behavior, sense of consciousness, memory, and perception of the outside world. Persons With DID, experience amnesia, which essentially are distinct gaps in memory and recollection of daily and traumatic events. They cannot be directly related to substance use as part of cultural norms or practices. Importantly, these symptoms must cause a notable lack of functioning in day-to-day life. As explained above, a detailed history from multiple sources and multiple longitu- longitudinal, longitudinal assessments over time is the, uh, is the essence. However, some evaluation tools have been developed to diagnose the ID. Some of these are below. Disassociative Experience Scale 28-Item Self-Report Instrument, whose items tap the absorption of outside information, use of imagination, depersonalization, derealization, and amnesia primarily. This association questionnaire, 63, question that measures, measures identity, confusion and fragmentation, loss of control, amnesia, and absorption. Difficulties in emotional regulation scale, DERS. 36 questions, subjective questions around challenges in goal-directed work, impulsivity, Emotional responses to situations, 
Ability to self-regulate emotions. Let me go on to treatment management. Some treatment approaches for disassociative identity disorder include basic structures from work with personality disorders in a three-pronged approach. Establishing safety, stabilization, and symptom reduction. Confronting, working through, and integrating traumatic memories. Identity integration and rehabilitation. The first step focuses on the safety of patients with DID as many patients present with suicidal identity ideation and self-injurious behavior it is important to mitigate that risk the second phase focuses on working with traumatic memories including includes tolerating processing and integrating past trauma this may focus on continuing to reassess traumatic memories with different alternate identities and may help with sharing of memories the third and final phase of treatment focuses essentially on the patient's relationship to self as a whole and to the rest of the world. Through all these phases of treatment, a strong therapeutic alliance and trust are encouraged. Now, this is kind of important because when you're dealing with these things, as someone who came out of a traumatic experience and depression and stuff, I went to look to help people, and some of the relationships I formed were on that purpose. And when you meet people in some of the you know, things you're trying to help them with are consistent, you know, insistence that there's no purpose and there's finality to their words and they view it as not worth living anymore. And it, it, it just, it just impacts the people around them. And again, leading to isolation and stuff is pretty scary and dangerous in my opinion, but this is just the things that I'm interjecting that have come to me through my life and being in these type of situations for, for the most part. The most common approach is via psychodynamic psychotherapy steps, which are broken down above. Recent approaches include the use of trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy. There are no controlled clinical trials for CBT, the reason DBT skills are used is essentially secondary to some of the overlapping symptoms between borderline personality disorder and DID. Even with varying therapy approaches, some core features of treatment include more education, emotional regulation, managing stresses, and daily functioning. I can't tell you how insane these problems are with what I was going through with you know, certain people I love. You know, this is Remember, I started learning about this stuff at between 30, well, let's say 16, you know, 52, so. It's a lot of deep dives into this stuff. Um, now where was I? Another mode of treatment is the use of hypnosis as therapy. DID patients are more <laughs> hypnotizable than other clinical populations according to literature. There have been some studies as recent as 2009 that have shown efficacy in the use of hypnosis to treat DID. Many DID patients are considered auto... What? Auto-hypnotic. <laughs> some techniques include ex uh, ex accessing alternate identities not present in the session, an intervention that can facilitate the emergence of identities critical to the therapeutic process. <laughs> this is so interesting because... You know, when you think about this, you've seen this in movies, right? But it talks about the efficacy. Like, there is, you know, literature and studies that show it does benefit certain things. And it's just a crazy thing about how certain people are more susceptible to it. And anyway, another mode of treatment has been the use of eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, EMDR. The guidelines, however, advocate for EMDR to be used as part of integrative treatment. EMDR processing is recommended only when the patient is generally stable and has adequate coping skills. EMDR interventions for symptom reduction and containment, ego strengthening, work with alternate identities, and when appropriate, the neg negotiation of consent and preparation for alternate identities. Psychopharmacology is not the primary treatment for DID. Medications may be used to target certain symptoms reported 
Most commonly used medications include medications for mood disorders and PTSD. The challenges of using psychopharmaceutical medications remain as different alters may report different symptoms, as some alter may report compliance and some may not. The literature preview has shown that many medications have been used for DID, including antipsychotic medications, mood stabilizers, and even stimulants. However, no medication has been effective in the treatment. Differential Diagnosis As mentioned above, the most common differential diagnosis includes borderline personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and even primary psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia and schizophrenic disorders. As mentioned, patients with DID often present with symptoms of disassociation and amnesia, which are also seen in patients with borderline personality disorder. When patients' symptoms are considered symptoms of psychosis, as alters are mistaken as hallucinations, and which often precipitate the use of antipsychotic medications. Given that trauma is a focus, post-traumatic stress disorder is also a differential diagnosis. The most common differential diagnosis is borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is also associated with extensive trauma, which is often present with micro-psychotic and disassociative symptoms. You see what I mean by how so much stuff is just interconnected? This is, uh, this is just, you know, especially when it hits home for you. Um, you know, I, I've been through this with my mom and certain people throughout my life. And to have someone so close to you um, accuse you of things and build arguments and stories that don't make sense and they in one moment they are okay with the way you talk because they taught you how to be open and free and talk like that and the next moment there they say don't be like that and these things go long and sitting with my mom in the kitchen for so many for so long and going through this it just you know it really impacts certain things especially when you're you know trying to like help people and be nice it just doesn't um no, it just doesn't feel right to a certain extent. All right, so let me see if I can find where the hell I was. All right, yeah, so we were at the differential diagnosis, uh, borderline personality disorder. Okay, patient studies and ongoing trials. There have been case studies and case reports formally reported in 90% and nearly uh, 90s and early 2000s. Some more treatment interventions have been described in naturalistic and longitudinal, stu longitudinal, longitudinal studies that continue to inform outcomes. Prognosis. This associated identity disorder is, unfortunately, a medical condition that is often diagnosed later in life. Often patients are misdiagnosed with other diagnoses as described above and treated with medications and even therapies that may not directly address DID. Once in treatment, this tends to be lifelong as DID patients continue to require reality-based and grounding interventions. Safety planning with DID patients is lifelong. The prognosis without treatment and correct diagnosis are poor. Complications. The patients remain at increased risk of self-injurious behavior given the presence of alters as well as latent trauma. There have, there have never... There have been newer research studies that have described suicidal ideation, especially during disassociation, which describes decreased pain tolerance and more emotional dysregulation. Most treatment interventions advocate for safety planning and reality testing before the use of more advanced psychotherapy techniques. Inpatient hospitalizations and day treatment programs may also be recommended for patients who struggle with thoughts of self-injurious behavior, poor impulsive control, or acute mood dysregulation. Medications may be added for mood stabilization. Deterrence and patient education. Patient education must focus on informing patients on the correct diagnostic when it is determined. 
Family members are encouraged to be educated about the nature of this illness, including the presence of altars as well as safety and grounding techniques. Another vital aspect continues to maintain a strong therapeutic alliance with the treatment team and engage in maintaining safety techniques. Education may be done with multiple altars that do not communicate with each other, and this must be recognized. On the other hand, DID patients often do not want their diagnosis shared publicly, and their privacy must be respected. You know, I've been, you know, you deal with someone, and throughout the years, you know them, they do, let's say, certain things, and they always come up with a different name. And when you look at the overlapping thing, because I'll be doing the borderline personality disorder, I'll do one on that. I just find it amazing and heartbreaking that even, like, I don't have degrees and stuff, but I do and have tried to use these techniques, and for a certain amount of years, it works. It just because, you know, maybe it's not so severe in one person or another. But I've been there. I've been in those arguments where suicide is just the only way out. And I don't know how to pull my heart out enough to everybody in this world, anybody who hears this. Reach out, talk to somebody. This can be scary. And in one of my things, it was about trying to do some cognitive behavior therapy and breathing and meditation, and the person was afraid because of their disassociation, and it was what led me to do, I think, that brain chemistry one I talked about. Anyway, I'll continue. Uh, Enhancing healthcare team outcomes. Disassociative identity disorder requires treatment by an interprofessional healthcare team. This will often consist of medical specialists such as a psychiatrist, mid-level practitioners, nursing staff, specialized therapists, trauma counselors, peer counselors, and therapists who all communicate and collaborate with each other. A psychiatrist and primary care physician complete the team. Maintaining a strong therapeutic alliance with both patient and involved family members continues to be of most importance. DID patients require frequent check-ins and follow-up appointments and an almost daily focus on safety planning and reality-based interventions. Now, this is another thing. You know, how many disorders overlap when, when over the years you, uh, you know, you, you distance yourself, abandon your friends, family, your pets, and you're left alone? It's, it's the preparation in their mind and what they're going through. And sometimes it's the classic young youth, you know, traumatized whatever and they're on a straight path to success because they'll just channel it all and just you know take the manic episodes and just keep moving forward forward and you find that people in the later life do become successful but they become a mess it's so nuanced and it just blows my mind all right so this has the links and has recent you know what it's led to and this is the basic of you know, dissociative identity disorder. However, I did want to go through something real quick, and this was by the National Alliance on Mental Health by Shirley J. Davis. A dissociative identity disorder, a misrepresented diagnosis. Like one in five American adults, I live with mental illness. My diagnosis, however, is less common due to early and severe childhood maltreatment. My personality fragmented, resulting in episodes of disassociation and the emergence of alternate personalities or alters. In other words, I have disassociative identity disorder. Thanks to dramatized media depictions of DID, simply hearing the name of my condition may conjure images of brokenness, violence, and terror. It is no secret that Hollywood has capitalized on widespread fascination with DID in the last decade. Multiple films and even television series have used DID as a plot device for murder and chaos. This tactic has been effective. The United States of Tara, a TV series chronicling the journey of a suburban wife and mother living with DID, drew in an average of 2.67 million viewers per week in its first hour episodes. The 2016 thriller Split, a movie following a violent predator with 24 personalities, raked in over 278 million in the box office. But do these platforms represent DID accurately? In my experience, media depictions of the condition are both inaccurate and harmful. It's hard to get the right diagnosis. Mental health providers, like the general public, are indonated 
with dramatized media depictions of the condition. When you see unhinged and aggressive characters with DID, or even harmless individuals with transition seamlessly between personalities, they may develop expectations of how DID will be present in a potential patient. This re- the reality of this condition, however, will look different in the United States of Tara. The protagonist switches between alters often. Her alters are easily recognized by and open with her family. And many individuals with DID, however, switches between personalities traits are more subtle. And other people may not notice a change. This only worsens how difficult it is to receive an accurate diagnosis of DID. The process can take years or even decades, as symptoms may be more subtle and certainly more complex than practitioners may assume. I, could, I consider myself one of the lucky ones to have received our diagnosis right away. People assume we are violent. When I was a child, I experienced trauma at the hands of my caregivers. As a result, my mind did not develop typically. Simply put, the stress hormones that flooded my young body, readying me for the flight or flight responses, never had a chance to return to baseline levels. So my brain was forced to compensate by compartmentalizing the atrocities I experienced. While I no longer identify as a victim of my childhood mistreatment, I identify as a survivor. I am certainly not a perpetrator either. The message we receive from, from movie depictions of the idea, however, suggests that I am someone to be feared. In the movie Split, a person living with DID diagnosis in prisons kills and eats three women. He even has an alter named The Beast that commits a variety of violent crimes. By contrast, I never have nor will I ever harm another person purposely. I am not dangerous in the least. I am simply a human being whose brain protected me so that I could survive. Stigma and misinformation is rampant. Movies like Split and their dramatized versions of mental illness bred misinformation and shape in an unhealthy discourse. People have asked me if it's fun having DID, and some even wondered aloud if they could develop the condition as an adult for their own entertainment. Such questions are not only inappropriate, but also deeply distressing or triggering. In addition to films mis- misrepresenting common pres- presentations of the condition, they also inspire the fear of DID and the people who live with it. A complete stranger once told me without knowing, I have DID, and he hoped that he never ran into a- someone like that, as he would be terrified of a person living with DID. I have even lost contact with two houses of faith because the leadership discovered I have DID. After all movies tell church leaders that I am possessed by the devil and must be exercised for my own good. As a result, I fear telling anyone I do not know well about my diagnosis. I keep my medical information private to avoid undue judgment and resulting isolation. You know these fucking religious cunts? Oh, don't get me fucking started. Fucking exorcist shit. <sighs> Ending the stigma. Until Hollywood makes strides in consulting experts and honoring those with lived experiences, we cannot simply accept media portrayals of mental health conditions as factual. Sensationalizing complex diagnosis offers a limited and inaccurate version of our lived experiences. Despite Hollywood's role in perpetrating stigma, individuals have the power to change the narrative surrounding DID. We can start by pointing out misrepresentations in a television show, or refusing to consume content that portrays individuals with the idea as broken or violent. We can call out misinformation in casual conversation and direct our peers to resources with facts and even accounts of personal experience. As I continue to live my life in a way that looks nothing like Hollywood's characterization of DAD, I will spread accurate information about my disorder. My life is evidence that people living with DAD are just resilient people managing a chronic condition. Now, this was so impactful, it gives me, like, goosebumps. This is important, I think. And whether it's someone I know who has it or someone I don't know who has it, there are people out there connected to you, maybe in certain ways. I always find it so fascinating to, like, learn about a little bit of a subject and to have a little knowledge of it helps me greatly. I don't have to do my, you know, quote-unquote deep dives where I'll treat something like a college course and you know, go through it, but just to understand what people go through in life. I'm so terrified by 
the aspect that they're uh, people I can't help and they're isolating themselves and they exhibit certain things and I, I sometimes don't know what to do. And even with my own issues, it locks me up and it creates these things that have to be dealt with. And I just am lucky. I just was lucky that I developed tools and techniques that helped me. And look, I'm not perfect. But when I look back at the people I love, the friends I made, I don't want to lose them to these things. I don't want to be you know, responsible for certain aspects of this when I'm just trying to be nice or helpful. These things impact and leave their own little traumas. So it could be a vicious circle. And my point in making these podcasts is to be able to walk away from these podcasts and with at least feeling like I don't regret informing people of certain things that go on in people's lives. My own people I know, people I've helped, and people I've come into contact with in this journey through life. It comes with understanding, comes with unconditional love. That doesn't mean we tolerate heinous crimes. You know, I'm not talking about the far end of the spectrum. I'm talking about someone you love, someone you care for. You know, you let them abuse you in certain ways. You let them get it out of their system hoping that they got the right team in helping them. But what happens when they don't? When they go off their medications, they stop taking their treatment. It could take up to nine weeks or more for stability to reattain and just keep it. And then it's still a constant workaround. And you can tell by these articles that there are things you have to do. Stability, reality control, keeping people in check in a way. But you have to admit these things are happening. You can't just isolate yourself and shut out the world. I know this firsthand from my depression. But the second, you know, someone PMs me or te- texts me, I'm totally there. Call me. Yes, it's a little, I get a little stressed out when it's a surprise thing and someone wants to come over or someone asks me to go somewhere. And this is my own thing. But. When you see the signs and you're lost and you're just trying to help, this is my therapy too. This is my way of putting it out there and informing people. Even if it's a little information, even if it's you hit the link and don't bother with it, even if it might be something that leads you to a false thing about someone you know. But maybe you'll learn that, oh, you know what, they have bipolar disorder or they suffer depression and some of the things overlap. But I think tolerance, understanding, and a real unconditional love is needed in understanding these things. So I implore that for everybody. Again, I don't think I'll just disappear. I think I'll let like my last podcast be known. I'm still not sure what I'm going to do. But this series of podcasts are going to be focused on me being able to walk away from my podcasting channel, YouTube or whatever. And not regret things. And again, I won't regret doing movies or TVs, although I like it. It's fun. I would regret not sharing a lot of information about mental health illness and disorders to whoever I can. So in that, I love you all. Even if you're mad at me, even if you're going through these things, I'm here for you. I will always be here. Call me, text me, make a joke. Nothing has to be held against you. I hope nothing is held against me. I would love to be able to love someone for their faults and their greatness, and someone would love me for my faults and my the parts of me that are good and caring. And look, we're not all perfect. So in that, I'll say my best to you and yours. I hope everybody's gonna have a great summer. I love you all. Take care.